Welcome back to Pod Save the World. I'm Tommy Vitor. I'm Ben Rhodes. I'm Max Fisher. Back in the studio, uh, the three of us for a special bonus episode of Pod Save the World to talk about a very special topic, the roots of the judicial crisis in Israel that has led to massive protests, uh, societal upheaval, and a lot of hand-wringing in this studio, I will say. The quick backstory on what's happening is Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu is trying to jam through changes to Israel's judicial system that would essentially strip away its independence and allow the coalition running the government to control judicial appointments and give the Knesset, Israel's parliament, the power to override Supreme Court rulings that find laws passed by the Knesset unconstitutional. For reasons we'll explain in a second, that is a massive change uh, in Israel's system. But today we just want to step back a bit and not necessarily talk about the headlines of the day, but examine some of the deeper structural forces that got Israel onto the brink of this crisis. Those structural forces include unresolved questions about the founding identity of Israel, Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu himself, and sort of how he's a singular individual in the country's history, and then the U.S.-Israel relationship. So, Max, over to you. So I, I think I love nothing fraud about it, this conversation at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's easy stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just, yeah. Riff yeah. a little. Yeah. We'll put it out. Yeah, yeah. It's not yeah. a big Just deal. A bonus episode. Yeah. I mean, I'm glad we're talking because I know it's it's something that we all think about a lot. We like see each other in the hallways and talk about this. Is like the future of Israeli democracy. I think it's like a really live question, and mm-hmm. like the future of the Palestinians and the future of the relationship. It's like a really live question that I think like really demands a lot of scrutiny right now. And so, like, to me. Everything that is happening right now, this big threat to Israeli democracy, all traces back to this unanswered question from the country's founding in 1948, which is, are we a democracy or are we a state of and for one group in particular? And the country's founders were very aware of this tension. They knew that the democratic world was, as was this happening, just then waking up this idea that you can't be a democracy for one group because a democracy for one group will inevitably become a dictatorship of the majority, probably just a dictatorship. But Israel's founders felt they weren't ready to answer that question of what kind of country are we just yet, partly because there was this large population of non-Jews, of Palestinians within Israel. So they never really finished constructing a government. I mean, Israel has no constitution. There's no Bill of Rights. There are no formal checks and balances because the convention that formed in 1948 to write that constitution couldn't decide how to define who is an Israeli citizen. What is the Israeli state? What are our basic rights? So that convention just converted itself into the Knesset, that legislature, which is still like basically the entire government. And it's out of that gap where the state was supposed to be that the Israeli Supreme Court, which is at the center of all this, rose up. And it became the main check on the power of the legislature, also gradually defined those basic rights that had never been set by a constitution. So it became like the main vehicle for advancing the version of Israel that is built on individual rights, liberal institutions, and the like. But this unresolved question of whether Israel is firstly a democracy or firstly a state for one group was still there. And it got heightened in 1967, of course, when Israel conquered the West Bank and Gaza, territories that were supposed to be Palestine. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's forgotten now, but there was this moment that I think is really important where the country's founding leader, David Ben-Gurion, came out of retirement when that happened and said, you have to give these territories up or it will yeah. put such a pressure on that contradiction of Israeli democracy that it will destroy it. And I think he was right, but it was actually this like slightly different but related contradiction that has put the Supreme Court at the center of what's happening now. And it starts in the 1990s when the courts began asserting more protections for individual rights, chiefly for women and LGBT people. And this is just for Israelis. It's not touching Palestinian rights, but it angers right-wing religious Israelis who feel the court is pushing the country too far away from the traditionalist Jewish identity that they want. And that starts this very movement. familiar story for us Americans here. Right. Yeah. Exa- I think this all yeah. sounds or, really or, great. Or, or like 20 other countries around the yeah. world. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Remind, yeah. It reminds me of your book yeah. a lot. Yeah. And it starts this movement to take away the court's power altogether. And in doing so to say, we have decided what kind of country we want to be. We're for one group first. And we are democratic second. And that movement against the courts really takes off in the 2010s when the Netanyahu government wants to roll back a bunch of basic rights in the name of national security, things like ban foreign NGOs, deport some rights workers. The courts stop him from going further. And that is when the big nationalist, often secular right, joins with the smaller religious right in saying, we need to know the court. We need to make the prime minister all powerful. And that was precisely what Netanyahu was trying to do 
in March and to a protest stop him because Israelis know that this court is the foundation of their democracy in a way that it's not in other systems. But at the same time that Israelis will fight to keep their democracy, I, they have still not really collectively decided what kind of country they want to be. How does reconcile this contradiction that's built into their founding? And you see this in polls. Like when asked explicitly whether Israel should be democratic first or Jewish first, Israelis used to say both. But now they mostly say it has to be one or the other. And the people who say it should be Jewish first outnumber the people who say it should be democratic first by like two to one. Mm. And that to me is kind of the core of all this. And I, I, I believe that until Israelis are able to resolve that question, which is also going to mean addressing the occupation, there's always going to be another crisis in waiting like this. That's like very well laid out. Uh, and and I, I mean, I agree with everything you said, Max. I, I think so I'm here to kind of make the case that BB has been singularly important to this drift away from democracy. Um, and, and the Israeli public opinion is both representative of like 25 years of Bibi Netanyahu politics as much as it is impacting it. That's true. Um, and here's how I'd describe it. I mean, I, I really like how you brought Ben-Gurion into this because, you know, part of what had happened since Israel's founding is that periodically, yes, the founding generation was balancing this identity as a democracy along with this identity um, as a Jewish state. And by the way, there used to be almost like a socialist identity too, right? Yeah, like the, yeah, very the much I, so. yeah. ideology of the kibbutz. Put that aside. But at critical moments, they, they and usually often late in their careers in an interesting mm. way, they would break in the favor of the democracy. Um, yeah, you that's know, true. So if you think about it, you mentioned Ben-Gurion, Rabin obviously making this, this, this military leader and hero, making this really hard turn towards peace before he's assassinated. Shimon Perez obviously got there <laughs> pretty early. Even you know, Ariel Sharon, who's an interesting guy to contrast with Bibi, the hardest ass in Israeli history in yeah. some ways, being this guy who's like, you know what, we got to pull out of Gaza, pull up stakes, give up this land in part because we have to accept that to be a democracy in a Jewish state. And, and, and that's what Netanyahu has never been willing to do. And, and I think you have to understand Bibi, his political scent kind of takes off in that moment after the Oslo Accord, right? Mm -hmm. Where Rabin has kind of laid down the marker, we're going to do this. Um, it feels like the momentum's moving in that direction. Bibi is a part of a really kind of virulent anti-Rabin, anti-Oslo <laughs> campaign. Rabin is assassinated, um, and I'm not going to go as far as some people say and kind of laying some of that at Bibi's feet, but he was no doubt a part of the criticism, right? Yeah, you could. A I little mean, bit. You yeah. could if you wanted to. Hey, Ben, but uh, remind listeners who don't know maybe what, what the Oslo process yeah, was. Yeah, the Oslo process basically sets the outlines for a two-state solution between the Israelis and the Palestinians. And so in, in mirroring the kind of mutual recognition agreements that had been made with Egypt and Jordan, the Palestinians formally recognized Israel, um, which they had not yet done. Um, the Israelis recognized the Palestinian Authority as like the governing authority of the Palestinians. Um, and they made all sorts of agreements to facilitate kind of more autonomy of the Palestinians, but also a lot of security control for the Israelis. And they punted you know, on yeah. the, what we call the final status issues, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what's the capital? Is Drew some capital for both? What are the borders? What are the long-term security arrangements? What happens to Palestinian refugees? Now, so Bibi kind of you know, he, he gets elected. Uh, Rabin gets assassinated. Shimon Perez um, kind of flames out. Uh, he's just not as good as a politician. Bibi defeats him. His first ten years, you know, we see some of what we got familiar with later. Didn't get along with the American president, kind of backsliding on Oslo. But it's really when Bibi comes back to power in 2009 that I think that he becomes a real accelerant in mm. liberalism in, in Israel. And the way I try to think about this is it's not unlike what we've seen with other authoritarian populist and, and ethno-nationalist populist, Trump, you know, Orban, um, Bolsonaro. It starts as rhetoric and performance. Right. But over time, the rhetoric and performance and the political style and the political kind of pugilism actually become substantive. <laughs> and this is like my core argument, because I remember going to Israel with uh, Obama for Shimon Peres' funeral in 2016. And I was lamenting that Shimon Peres had this huge legacy for Israel, right? Mm -hmm. Helping to literally build the country and its scientific and military base and probably its nuclear weapon. But what's Bibi's legacy? You know, oh yeah, I get to be prime minister forever. And, and Obama said, well, his legacy is he destroyed the, the Israeli left. But actually bigger than that, if you step back, you know, he comes in and, and what, what does he do? Well, he, he defends settlements um, at the same time that that enterprise is growing. 
and that enterprise is making a Palestinian state less and less possible. And at the same time that settlers are beginning to assert themselves in different ways, like violence uh, against Palestinians. Um, and so suddenly, like the substantive embrace of some settlers over time kind of begins to have a real substantive impact on, on the map uh, itself and on the nature of Israeli society. Um, you know, he mouthed these words about a two-state solution, but by the end, he's just against it, basically. Um, but importantly, like his conspiracy theories about NGOs, at first they were kind of, you know, we've joked about them, like the, the State Department funding, like Israelis and Palestinians playing basketball, he's blaming his like political interference in the election. But lo and behold, like, then that become restrictive laws being introduced against NGOs. Mm-hmm. Or he really stressed Jewish identity um, mm-hmm. over democracy in his rhetoric. And yeah, nationality laws start to show up and suddenly maybe you can get your citizenship revoked. And he crossed certain taboos and third rails that Israelis, they didn't used to like to talk about the fact that it actually is already a multi-ethnic state without even, say, the occupied Palestinians. There are a lot of Arabs in Israel. Well, when Bibi comes out on Election Day in 2016 and starts talking about the Arabs are voting in droves as if they're foreigners, as if they're not Israelis, that was a seismic moment. It's like, okay, we're now on the other end of, you know, uh, of somebody saying this and normalizing this. And th- then we start to see laws that, that create second classes of citizenship. You know, he always was kind of cozy with like the, the guy who owned the newspaper or whatever. But then it starts to become like actual corruption. Like mm-hmm. if you don't report what I want, you might lose your license. Right. And, and so over time, we're seeing rhetoric become laws, become like settled political questions. And the frustration he said over time with the Israeli legal system, same way. It started like it does here, like activist judges suck. You know, he uses the same kind of rhetoric. And now we're like looking to defang the Supreme Court. So I think Phoebe's one of those guys who's kind of he's fooled a lot of people over the years because he didn't come out at the beginning and say, I would like to transition Israel to a not a democracy right. like Orban did on Hungary. But the effect of everything he's done and unleashed has has brought us there. And, and once you get to contrast him again with the founding generation, once you get a leader who's willing to put his own political interest over over anything, that's what accelerated this devolution in Israeli democracy. Um, and and Tommy, I <laughs> kind of leads to the question we're going to talk about because the, the two points I'd say to, to tee up the U.S. relationship piece is this identity question, first of all, is very uncomfortable because I don't know how it was for you, Max. In, in my house, this was a settled question, right? Israel yeah. was a democracy and we were super, super proud of it as a Jewish state, but we were more proud because they had built this democracy. And, um, and, and so I think a lot of American Jews just take it as more settled than the poll you cited for me. And they right. think, what do you mean this is a question? And so in a weird way, they were less alarmist about Bibi because they thought, well, he can't really destroy Israel's democracy because that it's, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of written in stone. Um, so that's one issue. But the, and the other issue is the extent to which Americans like to hear like whatever shred of an inkling of something Bibi says that sounds reasonable, they grab onto and mm-hmm. they ignore all the rest of it. You know, yeah, right. he gave one half ass speech about a potential two state solution in some completely impossible future in like 2009. And I can't tell you how many times I heard, you know, as he was killing yet again, another peace process. Well, remember, he took that courageous step in 2009. It's like, uh, no. Yeah. I mean, he's an interesting guy because, you know, Bibi Netanyahu's brother was killed, the only Israeli commando killed in this daring rescue Mm, operation in Uganda in like the 60s. -hmm. And I think that relationship helped him rise to fame and rise to power. And then I thought the way you laid it out was really interesting in that all his sort of darkest rhetoric becomes policy and sort of corruption spirals. And he creates all these political and legal problems for himself that he has to solve or has to, that he tries to solve by tacking further and further to the right. And getting more power. Yeah, so you can see this judicial coup, as Haaretz calls it, as a process to help his coalition pass a law that will make it so he has to get a jail-free card and can't be prosecuted for these laws. Or this uh, judicial coup is an effort to forge a coalition with right-wing forces in Israel that previously were seen as completely out of bounds, essentially were viewed as terrorists. But now he needs them as part of his coalition. And so he's willing to uh, go to these really dark places and defang the courts to, in in essence, to do the policy bidding of some of these far right groups. In a weird way, he's done that to like, and now I'm just going for it, to AIPAC. Because like their their, uh, defenses of, of Israel and their attacks on Israel's critics have kind of mirrored you know, the increasingly 
pugilistic, you know, mm-hmm. you know, like like uh, politics of, of, of BB in a way. Like um, it, it's well, part of what you're saying is like he's kind of just been this gravitational pull to, towards. But over time, that gravitational pull like fundamentally changes the character of the organization to the point that now APAC is doing something it never did before, which is it has a super PAC that's like literally trying to take out yeah. Democrats. Democrats, like, liberal you know, Democrats. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, Ben, let me ask you about something you said, because I, I think that it's a really important point you made that Netanyahu has, he started out just opportunistically exploiting these kind of fissures and unanswered questions in Israeli society, and then that ends up becoming reality because he's so effective at widening those divisions, which of course is something you see in like one country after another, where you yeah. see these right-wing populists, where there's not, they don't have like a master playbook for like, here's how I'm going to bring about dictatorship, but it just like, they take step after step, and then they weaken themselves, and they paint themselves into a corner like Netanyahu has. I think the question that I wrestle with is, is it too late to untangle that, to roll that back? This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. How do you balance time for yourself in a given week and time for others? Um... I'm gonna say like exercise fully, me time. Yeah. So I do that. Uh, let's be honest. You know, like when you when you go to work, like you 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 work in a little bit of time for yourself. Me time. Even the That's office, my scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. I think Love is doing it right time, now. Scrolling away. Um, I was actually sending a thank you note. Oh, wow. That's some you time too. To yourself. Uh, yeah, I did, did, a, did a little pat on the back. <laughs> listen, listen, that gratitude. It's so easy to get caught up in what everyone else needs from you and never take a moment to think about what you need from yourself. But when we spend all of our time giving, it can leave us feeling stretched thin and burned out. Therapy can give you the tools you need to find more balance in your life so you can keep supporting others without leaving yourself behind. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire and get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. To hear a special message from Crooked World on the importance of mental health, visit betterhelp.com slash crooked world. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash crooked world and get 10% off your first month of therapy when you sign up. Pod the World is brought to you by Indochino. Uh, it's wedding season, people. Sure is. Spring, summer, early fall. I bet Ding everyone dong. listening, you got a wedding, wedding coming bells. up. You know what you want to do? What do you want to do? You want to look good at a wedding. You want to look sharp. You want a new, fresh suit. But looking sharp all wedding season shouldn't be expensive. No, it shouldn't. With custom-fitted suits from Indochino, you'll create priceless memories without costing a fortune. You can customize your shirt, suit, dinner jacket, and more in a range of colors from traditional black or gray to burgundy or olive to a classic Hemsworth navy. Every suit is made to your exact measurements, and you can customize every detail. Create a suit that fits you and your style perfectly with options for fabrics, lapel, shape, custom monograms, statement linings, and more. They also have tuxedos starting at $579. Why rent when you can buy a custom tux that you can rewear for years to come? Indochino also offers completely custom fitted shirts, casual wear, and more. Get a superior wardrobe personalized to your style and taste without the luxury price tag. They're always adding new pieces and options so you can stay on trend and in style. Explore their relaxed yet refined approach to spring suits with their new spring fabrics. Look, we've all had great experience with Indochino. We've worn their suits to weddings, to other Including our own. Including John's. They look great. They feel good. And the price can't be beat. RSVP to your next wedding knowing you've got the perfect look all wedding season long from Indochino. I'm going to include that in the RSVP. Go to Indochino. Coming in, I'm wearing an Indochino. Go to Indochino.com and use the promo code WORLD to get 10% off any purchase of $399 or more. That's I-N-D-O-C-H-I-N-O.com, promo code WORLD, Indochino.com, promo code WORLD. Illuminative has produced a new podcast called American Genocide, which is about how the U.S. government conspired with the Catholic Church to erase Native communities, the crimes committed by Native American boarding schools, and the generational trauma they left behind. This podcast is a gripping true crime story that traces America's attempt to reckon with its past and centers the stories of real Native people and the fallout from the historic abuse of Native children. In the podcast, you'll hear from two Native Americans, one former journalist and one activist, who travel to the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota to chronicle how the dark history of Red Cloud Indian School has caused a rift in intergenerational trauma within the Oglala Lakota tribe. The first two episodes just dropped last week, April 26th, with new episodes launching every Wednesday until May 24th. This limited series will include six episodes in total. 
You guys should check out this podcast because we know Crooked listeners are dedicated to uncovering the truth, to examining untold stories, and uplifting the voices of marginalized peoples. For a listenership who has come to love Crooked's own insightful, principled current affairs programming, American Genocide is a perfect historical true crime companion podcast. Be sure to listen and subscribe to the American Genocide podcast. You can find it on iTunes, Spotify, and other streaming platforms. Find out more on their website at illuminative.org. Let's face it, we put our moms through a lot. I know I did. There's no way I'm letting Mother's Day slip by this year. I didn't let it slip by last year, ad. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) So accusatory. I'm thanking my mom with farm fresh flowers from Books. Books. That's short for bouquets. I got you guys 20% off. Thanks, So you can thank your moms, too. That's just from me to you guys. Thank you both. Moms are the best. Moms are the best. Love my mom. Huge mom uh, fans. Uh, once you have a little one, you realize what a pain in the ass you were. No, shit. you were a baby. Yeah. So thank you again, mom. I love you. Great. Very nice. You can give your mom regular Mom's Day flowers, or make her day with spectacular flowers from Books. We're saying Mom's Day now. I'm not. Uh, I'm not. I'm just saying what the ad t- tells me to say. You know. Here's what I love about Books. Books is different. Their flowers are sourced directly from the best farms and cut fresh, so they last way longer. They even have flowers grown on the side of a volcano. What? Books offers a huge selection of unique designs you'll never find on those other sites. It's like a bad place to grow yeah. flowers. <laughs> it's, you know, okay, wherever you can. Pick your favorite tulips or lilies or send a bright and beautiful bouquet to make up for those gray hairs you gave her. Mother's Day is May 14th. You can't die for that. Don't, don't let it sneak by. Order your books now. And while you're there, check out their flower subscription so mom feels your love all year long. Go to books.com and use promo code CROOKED for 20% off. That's B O U Q S. Dot com promo code crooked. It feels too late on the Palestinian issue in a lot of ways. Just yeah. to, like there's a territorial problem now, like with with the extent of settlements and um, in terms of Israeli democracy, I, I think you know part of what he's done. This is Obama's point, but destroying the Israeli left is they have not had a leader come along in a long time who's made really really made the alternative case. You know, yeah, they, they've had you know Yar Lapid kind of tried to they all tack to the center and the center has moved to the right you know yeah, exactly. like we've seen this Benny Gantz yeah, was seen exactly. just like yeah. breath we, of fresh air we've seen this story right but and I'm not saying they have to be some kind of left wing progressive but we have just not seen a charismatic um, compelling Israeli political figure really challenge this narrative yeah. of kind of like we don't care if we have to become more authoritarian so long as you know we are uh, like the the Jewish state challenge that identity points and like really make the case for why it's better for Israel to be a democracy and a Jewish state. I mean, I, I know people would say they had, you know, Bougie Herzog at times did and Zippy Livni at times did, but like nobody's really been in the weight class of Bibi on that yeah. question. Yeah. I think and that may be the only thing that could reverse it. And, right. Max, to your point though, I mean, one challenge for the Israeli left is I, I imagine the people, the types of people who are moving to Israel, right? I mean, yeah. you're, it's and not, the demographics that right. is being born right. in Israel. Right. So, it's, yeah. it's not, I, I look, I don't know this for sure. I'm not looking at data right now, but I hear less about the sort of socialist vision on the kibbutz yeah. than you hear about like hard line yeah, right. rabbis yeah. in yeah. Brooklyn yeah, moving right, yeah. to Israel yeah, to right. live on settlements. Right. Well, let me read some stats because I think it's I think it's both like where is where is the pro peace left? I think it's both a demand side and a supply side yeah. Yeah. problem. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Where, well said. Sixty two percent of Israeli Jews identify as right wing. But. If you ask Israeli Jews who are between the ages of 18 and 24, it is 73 percent. Wow. So just like it's right wing. It's getting more right wing. It's, it's getting yeah, much it's kind more right wing. kind of runs counter to what that looks right. like in most places. And even, mm-hmm. even if you talk to, there's this really interesting poll that the Israeli Democracy Institute does where they, they kind of test like revealed preference around democracy versus Jewish identity where they say, do you think everyone who is an Israeli citizen or just Israeli Jews, who are like three quarters of the population, should be involved in big national decisions. And if you ask about security policy, 80% of Israeli Jews say that only Jews should be allowed to set those policies. But you know what's so ironic about this, Max, is like if there there's this kind of trust in the kind of securitized yeah. part of the state, but the people who've raised their voices in the most alarmist tones for the last decade or more have been the, those guys, yeah. <laughs> the, the yeah. security guys, yeah. you know, the, 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 the people in the military uh, or in the Shin Bet uh, warning about a two, two-stage solution disappearing, right? I mean, right. it's kind of yeah. interesting. It's a good point. Yeah. yeah. And they were really trusted institution. Yeah. 
and like also has been really vocal on the Supreme Court yeah. stuff, which yeah. is is both heartening and is also like it's a little worrying when the military is the one getting yeah. involved as the like vanguard oh, yeah. or like safeguard yeah. of democracy. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, never yeah. great it's when ne- you're like, rarely yay, ends well. <laughs> yay, army. Rarely ends well, yeah. Um, the question of what will reverse it is an interesting one because they've tried, if you think about what's been tried, they've tried a lot of different things, right? So mm-hmm. they did try a kind of military, Benny Gantz was the product of, right, a bunch of military guys essentially getting together and be like, the politicians are not working and standing up to BB. So who's the best guy to kind of be the front of a new movement? That's Benny Gantz. That didn't work. Lapid was kind of this, like, the telegenic, you know, uh, new Israel, like, entrepreneurial. Right. And he's, like, the face of that, like, the, the centrist personality who's going to uh, stand up. That doesn't work. Then they tried, like, everything. They're <laughs> like, okay, we'll grab Bennett, you know, uh, we'll grab our own Jewish nationalist. Uh, and we'll have Benny Gantz, and we'll have Lapid. So we've got, like, the military, <laughs> and we've got, like, the kind of Tel Aviv, you yeah. know, broadcasting types, yeah. and we've got, you know, young, more liberal entrepreneurs, and then we've got, like, uh, <laughs> Natalie Bennett. The neolib here, who, potluck. Who, who just hates, like, a, hate, he's a never bb you know? He like, right, just hates right, BB, right, right? right? And that, like, didn't hold, you know? Um, and to your point, that, so how much of that is because BB Netanyahu has shaped Israeli politics for for so long mm. how much of that is the demographics of israel changing like between not just people moving there but the, the people who are having more kids over the last 20 years tend to be you know obviously more conservative um how much of that is the u.s enabling all this and yeah. not like doing anything to to arrest it that's the tough question right yeah well let's get into this u.s piece um I want to talk about sort of the official sort of Washington to Israel relationship. But first, I had a cultural question for you guys, because you, you may or may not have noticed, but I'm a bit of a wasp. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, these founding yeah, identity yeah, of Israel yeah, questions yeah, weren't yeah. happening at yeah, my dinner yeah. table. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Golda Meir wasn't like a, an, an extra presence at your dinner table. She wasn't table. on the wall. Yeah. I so, think if you could name seven Israeli political parties, yeah, you get, yeah, you yeah, get, yeah, you get yeah, some yeah. points. Thank you, thank you. So I've been reading this great book. It's called Our American Israel by Amy Kaplan. She's a scholar. She does this deep dive into cultural ties between the U.S. and Israel and sort of the founding narratives of both countries. And it's interesting because like the short version is that both countries want to tell a story about themselves as throwing off the yoke of their colonial rulers, in both cases, the British, Mm -hmm. and being these underdogs uh, while ignoring conversations about indigenous communities that were displaced in that process, right? They want half of that story to be highlighted, the other half not. Kaplan also highlights um, uh, the fact that the sort of collective American ego uh, was so damaged in the 60s by uh, the lack of clarity or moral victory uh, in Vietnam, or any victory in Vietnam, that when Israel kept pulling off these incredible, daring military victories like the Six Day War, it was seen as like what we aspire to be. That's interesting. Yeah, and mm-hmm. she also highlights the influence of the book and film Exodus, which uh, I think the film came yeah. out in 1960. Yeah. It portrays Israel's founding as basically like a frontier Western uh, founded <laughs> by like the most sort of handsome, telegenic people you could find, like Paul Newman, sort of the lead. And I just wondered, did you watch Exodus? Did you read the book? Did you hear about these <laughs> narratives at the dinner table? In my family, because we were not particularly religious. Um, and not just kind of by the time it got to me, like even my like full-on synagogue every Saturday, uh, you know, uh, relatives were not that religious. You know, like my mom's, you know, parents kind of thing. And um, there was this kind of weird guilt like you know we we came here you know to to new york and you know we're living on in right. manhattan and right. we, they're out fighting against the, the palestinian stuff. you know right. they're out like building this country and you know facing I th- down Arafat. i think deep in the heart of of every like particularly like american jews who came of age in the early years of israel when it wasn't like this you know was like well they're over there fighting you know we, we were just over here, you know, trying to make it in, in the U.S. So that was part of the culture of it. Then there was definitely like a massive heroic narrative around both the mm-hmm. military victories mm-hmm. and these political leaders, just giants like Ben-Gurion and Golda Meir and Rabin and all these people. They were like, you know, you knew about them as much as you knew about like American uh, presidents in some mm-hmm. ways. Um But then, you know, like there was always like also like a discomfort um, about the Palestinian piece of it, you know, because I think people understood the the unfairness. But there was kind of like these other events that moved in the other direction, like the aggression 73, 
the Munich Olympics. You know, I remember being very aware of that in my household. They kind of discredited the, the view of Israel's military ebbed and flowed, right? I mean, I think during yeah. the, the 1982 uh, invasion of Lebanon, there was a lot of condemnation of the Israeli military. Although yeah, when sure. the sort of Palestinian yeah. leadership was seen as embracing terrorism, I think that revolted most Americans. It, it started yeah. to turn, you know, and I mean, Max, I, like, I, to kick, kick, like the other thing that happened. Over the course of my, you know, we're, I think, all about the same age, right? Uh, so we're growing up in the 80s and 90s. The awareness and methodical um, and necessary, entirely necessary commemoration of the Holocaust actually kind of grows in some mm-hmm. ways, right? My, yeah. Like, I felt like my awareness of that event and its centrality to kind of human history oh, yeah. actually grew. And, grew in the 80s. Yeah, and, and then you get, by the time you get to Schindler's List, like, that wasn't happening in the 60s. No, they the, weren't, they were not yeah. making... Carter sh- commissioned the Holocaust Museum. Yeah, the Holocaust right? Museum, yeah. right? Yeah. They weren't making yeah. Schindler's List or opening Holocaust Museums in the 60s. And that also, it associated Israel with that event um, in in a way it always has been, but like it kind of refreshed that piece of the Israeli never again legitimacy, piece, yeah. which is, I'll talk about later why that's a complicated piece of business. But like, um, yeah, uh, you know the I, I, the way in which the Holocaust commemoration interacted with this issue is is, is in, in in American Jewish thought is interesting. Right. There's a story that I think about a lot from from my family that I think represents for me the kind of shift that's been happening more recently in American Jews' attitudes towards Israel. In uh, 2014, my sister and I took our dad to Israel. My sister had worked a little bit in the West Bank on water issues, so we both like felt very strongly about it. And my dad, like most Jews of his generation, was just like, these really are the good guys, like they're us, but like stronger and better. And like, you know, the Palestinians are the bad guys. And he talked about growing up you know, they were passing a cup around at synagogue to raise money for yeah. IDF uniforms. Where was in that? Seventy-three in New Jersey. Jersey. And yeah. the kibbutz, they used to send money to the kibbutzes and stuff like right, that. Right, yeah, right, yeah, right, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. So this was like his association and what he expected to see. There, we said, okay, we're going to take you to Israel because he'd been asking to go for years. But we're going to start by going to, um, you know, Bethlehem, and we're going to go to Hebron. And Hebron, for people who don't know, is just like it's ground zero for the occupation. It's a divided city where half of it is controlled by a very small number of very extreme Israeli settlers. And the other half is a large number of Palestinians who live under really horrible conditions. And our dad came away from it just completely reversing himself, just saying this is unsustainable. This is crazy what's happening. I can't believe this. And, you know, even walking around like the beautiful parts of Tel Aviv. He was seeing the kind of occupation projected onto it. And the uh, Gaza war broke out like two weeks later. So it ended up being a very fateful trip. And like obviously most American Jews are not going to Hebron and seeing it firsthand. But I think that year in particular and a lot of what has happened since in the occupation of the West Bank and especially Mm -hmm. conflicts in Gaza, I feel like a lot of Jews, and I think you see this in polls, are starting to really change how they see Israel and are not seeing it as an extension of themselves or their identity or their values anymore. Mm, wow. So th- that's a fascinating uh, sort of cultural window into the into the conversation. Let's talk about politics, uh, sort of official Washington to, to the Israeli government. So these days, I, I think most observers feel like there is very little to debate, or more recently, there's some debate. But for the last couple of decades, there has been little debate in Washington about the U.S.-Israel relationship. To the extent there was debate, it was usually politicians sort of jockeying to one-up each other to declare their support yeah. for Israel, to yeah. be more pro-Israel. Here's a couple of rhetorical examples. The connection between the Israeli people and the American people is bone deep. Let Bibi know that... Uh, We are with you. We are with Israel 100 percent. Israel and America are connected now and forever. Is a true friend. It is our greatest ally in the region. I stand with Israel because of our shared values, which are so fundamental to the founding of both our nations. And our nation's friendship with Israel is not negotiable. So that was uh, Biden, Trump, Pelosi, Obama, Vice President Harris and Mitch McConnell. But that you know, <laughs> completely united opinion wasn't always the case. Um, and the big picture question I want to ask you guys during this section is to what extent is America's shift to total and complete unquestioned support for Israel and Israeli policies in a lot of cases contributed to the crisis we see today? So first, a quick mm-hmm. bit of history. Um, the U.S. was the first country to recognize Israel as a state in 1948, as you mentioned, Max. And for many years, 
uh, many decades, really, the U.S.-Israeli relationship was kind of normal with ups and downs based on events and interests. For example, in 1956 and 57, President Eisenhower put enormous pressure on Israel to withdraw its troops from Egypt after Israeli troops uh, occupied the Sinai Peninsula. The U.S. even joined a U.N. resolution condemning the occupation and privately threatened sanctions and to cut off private assistance to Israel. And it's just, as someone who worked in government during the Obama administration, it's unimaginable Mm -hmm. that any president would do that today. But again, in 1981, After Israel bombed uh, an Iraqi nuclear reactor, President Reagan suspended delivery of fighter jets to Israel, and the uh, the U.S. again voted in support of a U.N. Security Council resolution condemning that strike. President George H.W. Bush threatened to withhold loan guarantees from Israel until the Israeli government assured him that those funds wouldn't go towards building Israeli settlements in Palestinian territories. And listen to uh, Bush's former Secretary of State Jim Baker venting his frustrations about uh, the Israeli government's failure to constructively engage in peace talks. Here's a clip. It's going to take some really good faith, affirmative effort on the part of our good friends in Israel. And if we don't get it, and if we can't get it quickly, I have to tell you, Mr. Levine, that that, uh, everybody over there should know that the telephone number is one 202-456-1414 202-456-1414. When you're serious about peace, call us. So that sounds a little less bone deep than, uh, than, <laughs> yeah, than yeah, Biden's yeah. take. Yeah. So the question is, what changed like, and when? Um, Max, do you have a theory? I actually do. I think that this history, this the bone deep history, is way <laughs> shallower than people think or that, that we recite to each other. I think it really it starts, I think, very superficially with Bill Clinton who has this idea that turned out to be, I think, really wrong, that in order to get the Israelis to go along with the two-state solution and to go along with Oslo, you have to just, like, hug them really closely and just give them whatever they want and make them feel really secure and really confident. To Dennis Ross theory. Right, L- yeah. Quite literally. Right, yeah, right, yeah. yeah. And then Martin, Martin Indyk had yeah, this line yeah. about hug BB close. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Because, you yeah. know, BB Netanyahu. <laughs> and then, of course, he just pocketed all that. Yeah. Um, and then I think it becomes cultural and does become a little bit deeper with George W. Bush and September 11 and the Second Intifada, which is the, you know, uprising and and very violent conflict between Israelis and Palestinians in the early 2000s that I think leads to this view among a lot of Americans that we're fighting the same fight and we're like two countries that are like-minded. And when you talk to like Israeli political scientists, they will say like that is actually really when it starts. So it's, I think it's so much more recent. I do too. I mean, just, just to add to what you said, George H.W. Bush was obviously famously hard on the Israeli government. You heard those clips. Bill Clinton then got 80% of the Jewish vote in the next election mm-hmm. and 78% in his reelect. So I imagine that sends some warning flags up in Republican political headquarters to be like, oh shit, we got to get you know, some of these votes back or else we're going to keep losing. I also think, you know, to your point, after 9-11, the Israelis understood terrorism in our minds as well as we did, right? So it securitized that relationship. But there was also the rise of the evangelical Yeah, this right. is where I was going to you know, go. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, Baker's a fascinating example of this, right? So Baker also famously, literally, to, to connect it back to Netanyahu, he barred Netanyahu from the State Department. <laughs> he was so, like... Uh, That's so incredible. He was so sick of this kind of, like, mid-level or, you know, upper diplomat... It, it, like kind of messing in around our politics, he's like he barred him from the State Department. If you fast forwarded 20 years, Jim Baker is controversial in the Republican Party in part because he's seen as having this legacy on Israel. Yeah. Jim Baker, who literally delivered multiple White Houses to the Republican Party, you know, um, is more is less po- far less popular in the Republican Party today than Bibi Netanyahu is, right? The man that he once yeah. barred from the State Department. Yeah, and point. I think part of that is that the evangelical movement at some point. And 9-11 may have had something to do with this and, uh, you know, uh, but like they somehow Israel just became more important. And I'm not this is a culture I don't know much about, but it's undeniable that Republicans used to be the party where there's a little bit more internal debate about Israel. Now, with with the evangelical movement and the securitization of the Republican Party of 9-11, what, what you were saying, Max, that's like a perfect storm of just uniformity of support for Republicans uh, uh, for Israel. And then Republicans figure something out, and they particularly figure out in the Obama years, which is that this is a good issue to divide Democrats on, you know, yeah. because they understand that in the Democratic psyche, we share a lot of identity with Israel. You know, like like most almost all members of Congress who are Jewish are Democrats and they're liberals. And but 
we also our values tend to make us sympathize the Palestinians, and so th- th- that dynamic kind of pulls support for Israel to the right, and it also makes it harder for anybody to step out of line. Um, uh, and as someone I had to write those speeches that you're playing, like I'm deeply familiar with how the language. Well, you know, well I, I want to ask you about that because I was, I was talking with uh, Jeremy Benamy, who uh, was head of J Street, yeah. and we talked about Obama's Cairo speech, which for those who don't know, it was this famous speech Obama delivered in June of 2009. It was an attempt to reset relations with the Muslim world after the Iraq War and, and post 9/11, you know, war on terror hysteria. And in that speech, Obama said, quote, America's strong bonds with Israel are well known. This bond is unbreakable. It is based on cultural and historical ties and the recognition that the aspiration for a Jewish homeland is rooted in a tragic history that cannot be denied, meaning the Holocaust, obviously. Um, And as Ben, I was wondering if you remembered where that unbreakable formulation came from, because, you know, maybe it had become sort of pat at that point. But I guess saying that to that room or to that audience does sort of say to them, like, hey, I'm reaching out to all of you. But like this relationship this is, is my still a special here. tier, yeah. right? Yeah. And, yeah. and you're never gonna hit that level. Oh man, it's a fascinating story. So, um, I mean, first of all, there were um, always suspicions of Obama that he wasn't sufficiently pro-Israel, despite having a relatively conventional record on Israel. Mm-hmm. You know, like came out of the Jewish community in Chicago in a lot of ways, um, voted pretty you know mainstream on things in Congress. And and I, I always thought I'm just going to name this like there was something kind of racialized about it, you, you know, like yeah. uh, oh yeah, oh the black guy's going to sympathize more with the Palestinians, you know, which is kind of a tell, right? That you're not treating the Pal- you're treating the Palestinians the Palestinians are treated in the same way that the blacks have been treated in this country. Well, interesting, there was yeah. sort of like Black Panther solidarity with the Palestinian cause very early yes. on, and yes. it was sort of seen as part of this like Che Guevara right. Uh, Cuba right. like sort of anti-colonial um, zeitgeist, which. I don't know. And that and that's who like culturally re- cool. And, well, and you'll remember from 2008, right? They would go after like Rashid Khalidi because he was kind of like a scholar that came out of that movement, or Edward mm-hmm. Said, you yep. know, mm-hmm. and people that Obama had expressed admiration for. Mm-hmm. But anyway, to get to Cairo, I think everybody knew going into that speech that he was going to be, you know, trying to reset a conversation with Muslim audiences. And so there was great concern that would, would he like throw Israel under the bus and, mm-hmm. and, and played into these fears that Obama was this kind of quiet radical. Yeah. Um, actually, we started to, so the ask, one of the main asks a member from APAC uh, before that speech, because they came in and said what they wanted to hear in the speech, mm-hmm. like that actually happens, um, was that Obama demand that the, um, that the Muslim world recognize Israel and recognize it as a Jewish state. Um, which was a super interesting ask because, you know, to get into the weeds, that's basically asking the Muslim world to renounce the right of return for Palestinians. Right. Like it's it's an int- that's not how they framed it. They and well, and the rights of Palestinians in Israel, in Israel. today. Yeah. So right. we yeah. did we didn't go there. So then it's like I remember being like, you know, we're gonna we're gonna just we're gonna hug is but what we can do is is state what Obama thought was the truth, which, you know, culturally, like for a lot of reasons, Mm -hmm. we had this bond that's bigger than me, essentially. It's 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 Mm -hmm. bond between our countries. Um, And and that's going to be a tough message to that audience. By the way, to fast forward, he then talked very specifically about the occupation in ways that American president never had. And so there was plenty in it, you know, for that audience. But the interesting one was the Holocaust, because Obama I remember part of that speech was supposed to be like hard truths, telling hard truths. So we were trying to call out Holocaust denial. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and, and after the tragic history, he then has some language condemning Holocaust denial. Got a tremendously negative reaction from Israel. Huh. Why? Because hmm. rooting Israel in the Holocaust undermines the idea that this is the historic homeland of the Jewish people. Yeah. Uh, it was fascinating, Max, yeah, right? Like, yeah, so, And yeah. I got a lot of angry phone calls. So what is this Holocaust stuff? I'm like, wait, I thought you'd like that. You know, like, <laughs> it's very um, surprising. And it, yeah. it actually, it, it, hand but hands. no, but this is, a, it was such an interesting moment to me because it lifted the hood on the difference between like a, a secular American Jewish mindset. Mm-hmm. Right. It is like, well, of course, Israel's history is in part rooted in the Holocaust. Obviously, it dates back to ancient times, but like, you know, it was founded right after the Holocaust and that, you know, the mass migrations and the and, and the, the world feeling like, you know, we have to get behind this. Um, well, but it's, it, a, it's a break from Israel's own secular Zionist founders. I mean, yeah. even the ones before the Holocaust who yeah. saw it as a creation of this like 19th century world. Yeah. You have to have like a homeland for Jews that is rooted in modernity and that like pick this place where Jews had been before. But the I mean, to your point, the idea that it is a like 
continuous 3,000 year homeland, which yeah. is often furthered to mean that like, therefore the West Bank should All be ours. Land. Exactly. Right, yeah, yeah, is something that is like kind of out of step with a lot of their own national founders. It is. That represents a movement to the right of the rhetoric. And and there really was like a, pol- pol- un- people will take everything I see out of context, but like, I don't see, not policing of the rhetoric. Issue? But, but the point is that like people watch your language on this stuff very carefully. Oh, and they will let you know word. if they don't hear unbreakable bond or bone deep, they will complain to you that they didn't hear it. Um, and, but at the same time that that's happening, right, um, you have a, a, a situation where like Israeli politics is moving to the right. So what is expected of American politicians in terms of their rhetoric is also moving to the right. And there was another thing that happened in Obama's first year, Tommy, you remember, uh, Obama met with a bunch of Jewish leaders and they got into a very brief uh, dispute that ended up being this thing that dogged us for eight years about whether the US could ever show any daylight from Israel. And Obama Mm -hmm. said, Mm -hmm. sometimes it's actually useful to Israel if the U.S. has a little daylight because we have some credibility as an independent voice. And actually the position in that room and then became something that was hung around Obama. And if you remember these debates, Tommy, like, I can't believe Obama ever said there should be daylight. The idea that we would never have daylight with another country on anything. You don't outsource your decision making to another country. It's absurd, but you lived through it on... The, the I mean, we don't have to unpack each of these, but the flotilla, the Goldstone report, there's always something where it's like, yeah. don't show daylight. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, well, and look, this sort of this unbreakable formulation ultimately is backed by Obama, at least, with a 10-year, $38 billion security assistance guarantee that I think speaks to the Holocaust narrative of never again and, and making sure that Israel has got this qualitative military edge. And over, uh, there was a CRS report, Congressional Research Service report from February 2020, that totaled up uh, the assistance in the U.S. has provided Israel with $150 billion in bilateral assistance and missile defense funding since its founding. So it's a ton of cash. So um, here's the big question, Max. To what extent do you think the U.S. owns some of the kind of political twists and turns in Israel mm. that led them to the brink of this judicial coup? I think it's a. I think that's a really important question for figuring out what should America do towards Israel right now, and also what should America do towards countries that are maybe going down a similar path. Like yeah. there are real lessons here for how do we think about America's relationship to India, for example, which is, which is like really you know different context, but like following a similar path. I think that if you look. If you go a little further back in the 90s, I think there's a lot of ownership. In the 2000s, I think there's a ton of ownership, especially as Israel is pushing so far to the right during the Second Intifada. My kind of contrarian take on this, but which I do come to through um, reporting and talking to a lot of security analysts and political analysts, is that while it would be the right thing to do for the United States to say this is no longer going to be unconditional. We are now going to condition this on democracy and on rights for Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza, whether that means a two-state solution or a one-state solution. I don't think that America has that much leverage Mm -hmm. anymore. Um, If you talk to military analysts, they will say, you know, for a long time, Israel depended on American weapons, but all those capabilities are indigenous now, which they did very deliberately so that they would not suffer militarily if the U.S. one day cut off aid. Um, economically, the military aid used to be equivalent to 10 percent of their GDP. Now it's equivalent to about 1 percent of their GDP, mm. so it's just not as much of a hit. And political analysts will tell you that Israeli politicians used to pay a big price domestically for being seen as not having the Americans on board. And that was Netanyahu's big asset. Is he was like, he gets the Americans, he can talk to them. And now they, Israeli voters don't really care as much about that because they kind of think like America just doesn't matter for us as much anymore. And they very carefully cultivated a lot of other allies, which has been this very deliberate diplomatic campaign they have called the Other Friends to like bring in other countries that can be allies for them to offset their reliance on the U.S. So I think I think that there was a window when we had a lot of leverage that could have forced things in a better direction. But I, I think that window might have closed. What that, about the diplomatic shield, Max? What do you, you, know, you mean yeah, focus on the security system? That's probably yeah. that's probably the biggest one. Yeah. The the Security Council veto. Yeah. The UN Security Council will occasionally uh, have resolutions condemning Israel for bombing Gaza, for the occupation of the Palestinians, things like that. And the United States has basically a policy of down the line vetoing anything, which does an enormous amount to shield Israel from international consequences. 
uh, and the UK and France, which formerly participated in that veto, have basically backed away from it in the last 10 years or so. And it's now just the U.S. that is the one saying the UN, we're not going to protect Israel at the UN. And it extends to the ICC, the International Criminal Court, and all these other pieces of the international system, right, too. Right, right, yeah. right. Ben, Max, I think, raises a really interesting question, which is, why is it the United States will move heaven and earth and send hundreds of billions of dollars to countries like Ukraine or Taiwan that are being invaded to protect those democracies, but seemingly doesn't have a lot to say when the world's biggest democracy, India, or the democracy in Israel, are doing things to harm themselves? This is such a big question. We may have to do another bonus episode Let's on this. <laughs> um, this has been really interesting. Um, like it, it, uh, The obvious starting point is we care about democracy when our geopolitical interests suit it and not when they don't. Right. I mean, that's the hard like, right, yeah. you know, these are the, the politicians. The only time they talk about democracy. And this is part of my you know, challenge, frankly, to like even the in Applebaum kind of view of, you know, it's Venezuela, Iran, Russia. It's easy to oppose autocracy in these countries. Um, it, India, Israel are, are harder. And Turkey even has been hard for us because um, mm -hmm. they're in NATO. Um, that's the problem. I think the, the corollary to that problem is in the Cold War, we supported all kinds of right wing dictators. Um, um, and then but but the, the, the end goal was democracy. Right. Like the end goal was open society, capitalism and kind of democracy. So that when we were achieving our objectives in the 80s, we started abandoning support for all those right wing dictators and they all collapsed, basically almost every one of them. Mm -hmm. And then you have this democratic tide in the 90s. We've never lived through a period of where like there's a democratic recession among our allies like this before. It's a right. new it's a new thing for Americans to, to to deal with, and we haven't found the tools. I focus on the diplomatic shield because I think in some ways you can suggest that there are certain security interests that you know are, are like that when states get involved, it, it, like it, it, they, it's more complicated for them to be completely values based. But what you say and how you vote and 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 how you you know what you emphasize in, in the national community that is in your control um and and, and that's what like a modi you know c bringing modi into this is useful it's very different in some ways because modi's obviously not dependent on us for you know mm. billions of dollars of security assistance in the way israel's is. but like he thinks that like at the end of the day we need him somehow more than we you know he needs us or something and so therefore we'll never criticize him and we'll do nothing i think we have to kind of un s s the first step is to not self-censor you know, I'd just like to see us try that on these issues with Israel a little bit more. And this is where we got in a bit of a different place in the administration on the quiet, intense diplomacy uh, around right. Gaza. But like, so part of it is just ha like, I'd like it to ask, uh, us to found a legitimate voice and to at least name this discomfort instead of standing up and saying, you know, the platitudes about Israel being the only democracy in the Middle East and we share all these values without like saying, and we're both struggling with <laughs> with them. It's not just Israel, right? So that to me, that's the biggest thing. And and as someone who does care about Israel, I I think they're wrong. You know, if I'm gonna bet that I can like ultimately dr somehow risk the U.S. relationship because I'm making agreements with like the Gulf Arabs, and uh, we were getting along pretty well with Putin there for a while, and. You know, maybe we, you know, the Indians like buy our defense equipment, like given the history of the Jewish people, that's I'd mm. I'd much rather bet on America. And so I actually worry that they're making a, a miscalculation because I think you're right, Max, that their judgment is, oh, we actually don't need this as much. But I don't know, man, it's <laughs> like it's a better insurance policy to me than thinking you can cobble together some other semi-autocratic friends. Well, know? I feel like this gets back to this like core question because yeah. they, the countries they're choosing to partner with are not Europe. Yeah. You're right, right. Yeah. It's it, it tends to be the like right wing populist ethno nationalist. Yes. And it's like a, a microcosm of the same choice. Do you partner with the ethno nationalists who love you because you're being really horrible to minorities in your country? Or do you partner with the big liberal democracy that expects you to have a liberal secular state, but also has a vision of that, that at least in the US works pretty well for Jews? Yeah. Yeah. The self centering frustrates me to no end. I mean, I, I, I rewatched in preparation for recording this episode and just to like drive up my blood pressure, uh, Bibi Netanyahu's speech, and I think 2015 yeah, Congress, to the U.S. Congress announcing his opposition to the Iran nuclear agreement. And when you juxtapose that with calls to or, or scolding of Obama for suggesting there might, in fact, be times when there's daylight between yeah. the United States and yeah, Israel exactly. on policies and saying, I mean, imagine if imagine if Joe Biden went to the Knesset and delivered a speech 
about the Israeli judicial system. And Maybe you should. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I would, yeah, I would yeah, love yeah, it. Yeah, now, yeah, their, like their response would yeah, be like, those yeah. are internal affairs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, we yeah, would yeah. Never How dare you? you. Yeah, yeah, but like, yeah, yeah. you know yeah. what? The, the Iran nuclear agreement and, you know, uh, preventing uh, the Iranians from getting a nuke matters to all of us equally, I would argue. And where so, that issue was in American politics at the time was, for sure. was like an identity politics Central. Issue, right? Yeah, right, Central. Right, right. So uh, just to close this out here, uh, uh, Max, you got a, uh, an idea for us on how to secure the future of Israel's democracy? I, I honestly, I know that's a, like, let me give you my like 3,000 word answer. I, I actually think that in some ways it is deceptively simple, which I think they have to solve the occupation. I yeah. think that the occupation puts so much pressure on all of these questions at the securitization of the state, uh, the pressure that it puts on identity versus democracy. I think that it is the thing that makes this so unsustainable. And it, that's not an easy thing to just snap your fingers and solve. They did withdraw from Gaza not so long ago, mm-hmm. so it's at least theoretically possible. But I think until that is solved, this is going to keep coming back. But I think if they can figure that out, which countries have figured out harder problems than this, then... I think you could have Israeli democracy prosper for a long time. Ben, you got to take. I'm glad you said that, Max, because like, and to tie back to like what you said at the beginning about your dad, um, I had a much like uh, uh, less vivid experience. Um, but I remember when we went to Israel in 2013, um, I was in a motorcade. That's what, so this is not, <laughs> this is not like out walking around. But we drove through the security barrier, right? And so for people who don't know, there's what's been described as a security barrier that's been built in basically the 21st century. And it's been, you know, it's described as a security barrier or a fence, you know. It's a big debate over what the color is. When you, when you actually yeah. drive through it, it's a prison wall. It's what yeah. it looks like. It is a giant, giant, very, very thick wall. <laughs> with like, f- like 50 feet in yeah, some places, Yeah, it right? is enormous in some places. And I remember even in a presidential motorcade, we had to drive through it. And I remember just being incredibly uncomfortable driving through that wall and then getting on the other side and the standard of living dropped hundreds of percent, you know, to, when you're in Palestinian Bethlehem. And this is like the richest. This is where there's tourism and that you can't live on the other side of that wall and not be impacted by that. You know, uh, and the, the, the securitization and the rationalization around the occupation, I think, has, is, is, is a cousin of everything we've been talking about or, or sibling. I guess I'd end as my speechwriter, which, which I don't normally, but like the reality is, like the reality is that this can change if Israelis, enough of Israelis want to change, you know? Yeah. And Keep marching. They, they really can change things. Like they have tremendous agency. It's, it is still a democracy where they elect their leaders. And, and Max, your point, part of what's so troubling is we all see the writing on the wall in the polls that it looks like actually it's kind of 60 40 for this direction. But we've seen that kind of politics change and pendulums change, swing back. And frankly, we've seen Jewish people do far more extraordinary things than, you know, um, in just Israel's history. So, you know, to me, that it's as simple as that. And in, insofar as the U.S. can play any kind of constructive role in that, um, that's important. Um, I think enabling Israel's uh, all, all the things Israel's been doing has is, is not been helpful. No. <laughs> um, um, so, yeah, it's just a question. People have to think that they have agency on this. Um, and that includes in this country. There's a there's a pretty focused effort to make people think that, that all these questions are just settled or it's not worth in, engaging in, in any conversation about it. And Or it's think, too complicated to understand. Or it's too complicated to understand, right? And or like you'll get the shit kicked out of you online if yeah, you say the like, wrong like word. Yeah, like we will. Yeah, like we will for this. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, Take yeah, your own political yeah, grade. Yeah. No, but I think that's exactly right. I mean, well said, both of you. And, and you know, just to close this out, I mean, I do think from a, from a U.S. perspective, I think it's fair to say that going from Obama to President Biden is a bit of a step back in terms of more of a, a traditional no daylight yeah. U.S. Israel policy. And I'm sure that probably frustrates some people out there. But uh, there is also, I think, a growing coalition of progressives on the left who are left who are willing to say who are willing to like have rational debates about the U.S. Israeli relationship and to say, I don't know, absolutely not the U.S should not uh, you know, allow U.S. aid to Israel to be used to annex the West Bank. That is yeah. obviously not what it's intended to do. And so you know, I think listening to those voices, propping up organizations like J Street that are taking a more thoughtful approach yeah. to the, the relationship than, say, APAC has uh, is important and I think will benefit everybody. Totally. All right, we well, solved it. We solved it. <laughs> Look at that. Good for us. 1948 to April 26 is when we recorded this. Check. All right. Well, uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. If you like these deeper dive issues, tell us some more topics you want to hear about.
because uh, we like doing them. Yeah. yeah, we've gotten some good ones already. That's all we got. Yeah.